there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Welcome to Secrets of Organ Playing podcast number 78. Today is Sunday, January 22nd, 2017. And today's guest is the French organist Jean-Paul Ambert from Alpe d'Huez where he is the titular organist of the cloaker organ of Notre Dame de Neige. This is the famous church which houses two manual and 24 stops organ uh, with the shape of the hand, basically the palm. You might have seen it online. And um, Jean-Paul is responsible for the organization of concerts with renowned organists from all over the world. And... Um, uh, Jean-Paul is the student of uh, Pierre Cochereau and uh, Jean Guillou, uh, where he studied in Paris from 1962 to 1965. His concert life is very, very active and he uh, appears in France, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, Italy, Russia, Poland, England and other countries around the world. Um, he likes very much to do organ transcriptions of uh, symphonic works such as uh, Preludes of Liszt, uh, Romeo and Juliet of Prokofiev, um, Richard Wagner Prelude of Tristan and Isolde, um, Verdi Ave Maria and uh, Haydn works and Rachmaninoff and Rachmaninoff, Scrabin, Mozart, other composers that he loves. And um, he has also recorded those works in uh, several CDs uh, and published uh, the transcriptions uh, with uh, publishers such as Boots, Le Duc and uh, De La Tour. In 2004, Jean-Paul Ambert was appointed Knights of Arts and Letters and in 2010 he was promoted to the rank of Arts and Letters Officer by the Minister of Culture. In 2014 uh, Jean-Paul was awarded the Medal of Knight of the Palm Académique. So in this conversation Jean-Paul uh, shares his ideas about uh, the lessons he learned from the Masters uh, Pierre Cochereau and Jean Guillou in his youth and also what it takes to lead this uh, great cultural life in this uh, ski resort uh, in the middle of the Alps uh, at the altitude of 800 meters uh, where he organizes uh, concerts uh, for uh, ski tourists from all over the world and uh, at the end of the conversation we will also talk about his organ transcription so if you are interested in any of those topics i think you will find this conversation inspiring let's go to the show thank you so much jean paul uh, for joining this conversation i'm delighted to talk to you about your creative work about your um, organ um, recordings transcriptions and in general your your uh, cultural life uh, that you're leading in, in your in your church uh, so thank you so much for your generosity and time and welcome to the show thank you so much to you for your invitation i uh, see that you invite many famous people many famous organists so i feel most honored to be in your list i'm honored too uh, jean paul uh, because uh, you always uh, you know we we will share great ideas and uh, points of inspiration for other people around the world and it will be very very valuable so let's start jean paul with a story f from your childhood do you remember uh, when you were little uh, how you first uh, fell in love with the organ I first studied the piano because my parents wanted me to study piano. I did not was uh, particularly fascinated, but uh, I did study. But when I was about uh, 
nine or ten, I don't remember. I was singing in the choir of my school, and uh, the choir director was a lady who was organist in a church, and she brought us all together to the balcony in the church, and I saw her playing the organ. She was not a very great organist, I dare to say, but she was a very good musician, and I was absolutely fascinated by the uh, powerful sound, powerful sounds which she could right. obtain with this instrument. And after that, I decided to, to play organ myself, and uh, I began to study with good teachers and good professors. So, I'm glad you met that woman, right, so early in your life, that she introduced this organ. Do you remember what kind of instrument it was? Yes, it was a Merklin with three manuals, mm -hmm. and after that, I was also organist in that church. So I knew I knew him very well. It was in the city where I was born, that's Clermont-Ferrand, in the center of France. And this church is a church Saint Genet les Carmes, and uh, she was organist there. And uh, it's three manual instrument, all mechanical, but uh, Merklin, like all the Merklin organs of this size. And uh, in Clermont-Ferrand, there are not very big organs. So the, Biggest one is the cathedral, which was a bit bigger, but not huge. We have no huge instrument in the center of France. We have Kudo on the east to Lyon, where there are great organs, or north to Paris, of course. Right. But you know, those medium-sized organs are very, very uh, also gentle, you know, full of sound and sonority and timbre. And it, it doesn't have to be big with five manuals, right? It, it could be three manuals is quite enough, right, sometimes? Yes, of course, it is quite enough. But it was an organ more for romantic music than for a bar or three or sonatas, of course, which I studied first. So it was not exactly what... Uh, the type of sounds which were needed for uh, Bach, three or sonata. True, Jean-Paul. Do you remember what was your first organ piece that you played in your life? Yes, of course. Uh, my first teacher was a blind organist. He was a student of André Marshall, and he was a very good organist. And uh, I think the first piece he gave me was a Vienne uh, Berceuse. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, this good. was in the 24 pieces. Right. Uh, And after that, I studied the Little Preludes and Fool by Bach. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately afterwards, uh, first trio sonata. Uh, wow. And, uh, yeah. so it's it's, it's complex advancement of yours. Uh, from Berceus, from Vierne, through Little Prelude and Fugue, right? And then uh, again f to e, the E-flat major pre uh, trio sonata. It's, it's yeah. not an easy piece, although it's the first one, right? Uh -huh. What was the tricky part for you in that uh, trio sonata? The, the fight, uh, was your question? Uh, what what would you? Uh, what was the most challenging thing for you in that E flat major trio well, sonata? The, I think it's what is the basis of organ technique is the independence of uh, hands and the feet. Mm -hmm. and, With uh, a very light touch and uh, the possibility of playing uh, right arm, left arm, and feet uh, without looking at the, to the feet and uh, without looking to the arms. And that's actually the basi basis of the organ technique, yes. And, and how long did it take for you to master this sonata? Uh, well, not so, not so long, in a few weeks, I think. And, a few uh, weeks? Oh, you are a genius. <laughs> Genius. No, no, no <laughs> not, but uh, I did study quite uh, carefully and uh, I did succeed. And it was what I gave also to my students. Uh -huh. We go very quickly and we start with little period and fugues and uh, then we, we start with the trio sonata. Do, they play very slowly, but uh, they have the right technique. Do your students uh, play the entire cycle of uh, little preludes and fugues or just a oh, few? No, just three, two or three. Two and three then, uh, mm -hmm. We make trio sonatas, and we also study uh, pieces by Marcel Dupré, for mm -hmm. instance, in the Tombeau de Couvrin, or right. the Franck, played Fugue and Variation. It, it's, that's the pieces uh, we start with, generally, yes. And uh, if you go back in time, when you played uh, Berceuse by Vierne, um, was it a, a tricky piece for you to master, those chromatic harmonies and uh, uh, sharps and flats, or was it not? Mm -hmm. No, because I am studied piano many years, so mm -hmm. this was not at all a problem. And I am very lucky because I was uh, very good at that time for a lecture at sight. Uh, I, don't was, I don't know what is the right word, for sight uh, playing. So sight my, reading, uh, yes, sight reading. Yes, 
Mm-hmm. My uh, piano teacher was very keen on this, and we made a lot of sizing uh, for for hands, and so uh, it was not a problem for me. Uh huh. And um, what would be your first advice for for a student who would attempt to play this berceuse today? For example, uh, how would you recommend that people start to learn this piece? Mm-hmm. First, to read it completely mm-hmm. and to understand what is going to happen in the piece, and then to uh, to get uh, used with these harmonies, which which can be a bit strange for people who has always played bar or just uh, Mozart, you know, and uh, and then to um, to have a own idea on the sounds which you want to produce. And uh, but I think there are no very great difficulties in that piece. It's just. Uh, to get acquainted with these harmonies, which is not uh, very common for um, somebody who has been always in the classical uh, bar and Mozart. Schubert. And they should analyze the piece also, right? The harmonies, yes. they should know what ha- what's happening, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly, yes, because they have to sequence and all these uh, strange accords for a beginner, yes. Mm-hmm. So classical harmony training would be very useful in this case, right? Of course, mm-hmm. of course. Yes. Did you have this uh, cl- uh, harmony and theory background in your youth? Yes, yes, I studied also harmony with my piano teacher and mm-hmm. counterpoint and all this. But at that time, I was making quite different studies from organ. So it's, uh, it's, uh, I always studied organ apart from other studies because my father wanted me to be an engineer. And uh, so he died when I was 16. So I said he wanted me to be an engineer. So I go on and... <laughs> I make other studies, but all the time I was also studying the organ and, and playing regularly every Sunday in a church and uh, till I was uh, uh, grown up. Yes. Yes. So, and talking about uh, that trio sonata, E flat major. Um, uh, if if you if you have a student today who who would be playing this piece. What would your uh, recommendation be to, uh, first uh, to to learn the hands and feet separately or just in fragments or very slowly? How you at pro- approach this son- trio sonata no, today? Think, uh, what I teach and what I do for myself is always to study one hand with a pedal and the other one with a pedal. Uh-huh. Mix. Two because, voices, right? Yes, mm-hmm. but not hands and then the pedal which come later. No, the pedal must will be immediately connected to one hand and, and to the other one. And when mm-hmm. we do this, that is a swing. And that was one trick which uh, Pierre Cochereau gave me. You you study two measures, you come back from one measure, two measures again, and you make all the pieces like this. It seems to have to be very long, but it's not, in fact. Just two measures, come back, one, two, one, and always the same. And uh-huh. go, two and measures at a time, two measure fragments, right? Yes, and uh, and you come back and always. So after that, you have no difficulties to go from one measure to another one because you have studied all the connection between. Yes, them. yes, yes. I remember reading about that in Marcel Dupré's um, uh, introduction to seventy nine chorales, uh, how he uh, recommends memorizing things. Right, mm-hmm. one two three four, one two two three three four, one two three two three four, and then one two three four measures. Yes. But Marcel Dupré could play from memory uh, a hundred and hundred and pieces, which not many people are able to do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you think that? Um, uh, impact that Marcel Dupré did in France uh, is still evident today? Unfortunately, I would say not, because a lot of um, professors now are fighting against all the what Marcel Dupré said about mm-hmm. pedal technique, about fingering, and everything. Personally, I um, I always do the technique of Marcel Dupré, and I teach this technique, but. I am very s- sad to to know that many of other professors say, "No, we must burn this call. This terrible. It's not good." And mm-hmm. Because yes, in France, many other masters wrote textbooks and manuals uh, how to play the organ, right? And and Tournemir and Langlais did, and um, and other people, right? Uh, and uh, they all had their own ideas, right? Besides very strict Marcel Dupré, right? Hey, Marcel Dupré was very strict, everything was measured, and uh, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, these people we are you are talking about are 
generally students themselves from Marcel Dupré. And after that, they decided to... Uh, no, I think the greatest problem came with uh, this uh, organist from northern Germany. And uh, we say that uh, Bach never used his uh, hill to play Bach, which I don't know why he would not have used a hill, but, uh, and also even play without the thumb, which is for me also very strange. And uh, at present, there are some professors who, who say to the students, no, you must play the chorales without the uh, hail and without the sons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't see any interest in that. This only works when uh, key tonality is uh, with maybe zero accidentals, one sharp, one or two maybe at most. Uh, if, if it's more chromatic, like E flat major, right, it's, it's already too, too, too difficult. Uh, what is the interest of that? The technique has to be at the service of music and not uh, the contrary. And, uh, you must have the most uh, practical technique to, to make the beautif most beautiful music. Mm -hmm. You must not, uh, find yourself a limit which is artificial. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think Bach was much involved in all these problems. Mm. Yes. So, Jean-Paul, what happened later uh, when you studied, uh, studied organ uh, with those famous masters, uh, the blind organist, right? What was his name? Uh, uh, the Pierre Cocherot, right? And Jean Guillou. After that, it was, I studied in Paris. When I came, finished my studies in Paris, I studied with Pierre Cocherot, which was a great luck for mm -hmm. me because it was a... Dream. Uh, such an honor to play on the organ in Notre Dame and uh, this instrument is so beautiful and it was my greatest musical impression when I first heard Pierre Cochereau for the first time mm -hmm. I think I in the cathedral and he was improvising a great prelude uh, for a ceremony it was such for me a shock okay, I will never forget that and I was so lucky when uh, I knew him uh, through friends and he proposed me to have a lesson with him uh, once a month during two years it was very interesting so Jean-Paul uh, when you heard this famous uh, improvisation of, of uh, Pierre Cochereau um, was it uh, an inspiration to you or you felt like a intimidation or fear because oh yes he is a great master and, and I'm just a, a student you know what it was, was both because both. the first the first time I heard him it was this impression I discovered first the cathedral which I did not know first the organ of Notre Dame and Pierre Colchou all this together was for me a, a new world which was opening but I after that I went to hear him many many times during the uh, Sunday masses and every Sunday I came back home I said so it's finished I never play the organ again because I will never come to that level mm -hmm. but anyway I, I, I did not stop I, so, probably uh, as many improvisers who start uh, improvising, especially in public, uh, we always have those moments we wish to forget, right? Uh, those mistakes or something happens in the middle of the piece and we still have to finish it, right? Uh, did you have those moments yourself? Oh, it can happen, yes, because. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do not much improvise in concerts. I do it sometimes, but I improvise during the service, mm -hmm. but not uh, really in concert. I, uh, I in concert, I prefer play uh, repertory. So let's imagine, Jean Paul, you're uh, playing in, uh, in a church service, in improvising, uh, let's say, postlude or a toccata or a or a prelude, right? And something happens, your mind, I don't know, uh, thinks of one thing and your fingers completely do the opposite thing. What, mm -hmm. How do you react and how do you stay calm? Uh, so it's, it's another thing I learned with Jean Guillou because I uh, studied also with Jean Guillou and Jean Guillou always said that uh, it's your mind, we must, we must be the leader and the finger of yeah. yeah obey to the mind. So uh, I try to, to obey to my mind and not leave the fingers play by themselves. Uh -huh. I try. So your mind, your, your, your uh, basically head, right, leads the way yes. and fingers follow, right? 
Yes, it's, it's a rule. It's not always easy to do, but uh, it's uh, the you know, I think is the best one, of course. You must uh, have a, a true conception of what you want to do and uh, try to make. But it's true that in some cases, uh, the fingers uh, uh, make some calls which are used too. And, uh, yes, yes. We sometimes lose focus and fingers start to wander, right? And pedals, uh, feet also start to play something else, right? Yes, and uh, uh, and many people get scared at that moment, right? Uh, maybe, oh, even panic, right? And sometimes they drop music, uh, d- drop and stop and uh, scream and run. But uh, it's not the best way, right? No, it's not the best. But I think you, uh, if you know at, at the beginning what you want to do and how you want to finish, that's also a uh, very important thing to, to know how you will conclude. So when you have this panic or instant, you can also go back to, to your first idea. Mm-hmm. So you studied probably with Pierre Cochereau, um improvisation also, right? Not much. Not um, much. Do you remember? Do you remember his um, his uh, advice for you about improvisation a little bit? Yes, he said first, don't give at the very beginning all everything. You must go um, little by little. Uh-huh. Um, New thing, new themes, but not all of this at the beginning. Your your first call must, must be too complicated. Everything must be uh, prepared and uh, yes, like in a good movie, right? You don't you don't uh, have a climax in the beginning, right? You have a climax in the end. Yeah. Yes, you have no, no surprise after this finish. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Or, or while reading a good book also. You yeah. turn the pages and are wondering what's happening next. So this this curiosity probably will be very but important in improvisation. able to make a very big surprise in the, first, in the very first call. He was also able to do that. And, uh, after that. But he did, he did it so well that... Uh, uh, is many organists and try, try to imitate Pierre Cochereau first, even now because he died uh, in '84, so it's quite a long time ago. And many young young organists who never heard him live are always fascinated by this improviser. Uh, yes, uh, yes. And Jean Paul, uh, do you remember uh, your uh, lessons with Jean Guillou? What did you learn from him? Well, Jean Yu is, was a very, everything must be exactly precise, the duration of every tone, everything, your, your position at the organ, you must not make too many movements, you must control everything. Mm-hmm. Everything must be under your control. And, and all, also, of course, I learned uh, from him and also from Cochon how they register the pieces. And uh, this is m- not so much by what they said, but how they did themselves. And uh, when I looked how they played during services or concerts, I learned very much from that. Yes, yeah, sometimes you observe the masters, right? And not necessarily uh, listen to what they say, but lis- listen to what they do. And but you... They, you, you and could be different things. One thing they say, and another thing they do, right? Of course, but it was the uh, best uh, I learned from them. Yes. Uh huh. D- did you also learn from the instrument itself, uh, from the, uh, I don't know, the Notre Dame organ or mm-hmm. other o- great cathedral organs? Yes, of course, because when you have uh, such a great organ at your disposal, you must have a lot of imagination to 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 view the instrument and not always uh, uh, limit to very standard registration. And that for that, Jean Guillou has a fabulous imagination. And, uh, I remember the time I was his assistant. I sent a stash, and uh, sometimes he, he helped me to prepare some pieces. And he had always ideas for finding new sounds, and mm-hmm. new, new ways of playing, and uh, always everything should be very clear and uh, lyrical and uh, that's that's a lot Mm -hmm. Uh, the organ in Santo Eustache is very unique because it has uh, this uh, council downstairs right as I remember Yes, of course, it was already in the years uh, uh, 70s, very long ago, I was Mm -hmm. the first of them at the console downstairs, 
and that is very useful because when you play upstairs, you are between the positive, which is in your back, and the great organ, and so you hear very much the positive, of course, and not the most powerful stops, which are uh, 40, uh, 14 meters higher. And, uh, but when you are downstairs, you can, of course, control uh, much better. That's, uh, what is the impression of echo downstairs? How do you... Uh, you probably depress the keys and then the sound bec- uh, comes to you after a second or two, right? Yes. In in uh, in Sadostar, the acoustic is very good. Mm-hmm. So you can play with just uh, eight foot bourdon. That's enough for the whole church, which mm-hmm. is, for instance, impossible in Notre Dame where you need at least 20 registers together. Mm-hmm. But in Sadostar, if you play with just one bourdon, always the full organ is always clear. Mm-hmm. That's a very, very good acoustic in mm-hmm. uh, the but of course, you must not play too quickly uh, for certain ways of uh, good uh, precision. Yeah. And probably, I don't know, articulate more uh, at the end of the phrase, probably breathe, yeah. right? Yes, the articulation is very... That's uh, what I learned very much from Jean Guillou, to, mm-hmm. to articulate mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, very clear play. Yes. Right. yes. Uh, because uh, if you don't articulate, then it becomes a mess, right? So, uh, you miss polyphonically complex things and contrapun- yes. contrapuntal work. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, what happened later, uh, Jean-Paul, uh, when you became an assistant of, uh, of uh, Jean Guillou, later on, uh, um, you were appointed titular organist uh, at Notre Dame de Neges, right? Uh, in Neige, in Neige, mm-hmm. in yes. Uh, I am still there, a typical organist, and uh, I org- organize all the concerts we make. We make about uh, 25 concerts every year mm-hmm. between uh, Christmas and mid of April, and uh, in July and August, because Alpe d'Huez is a ski resort. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of people uh, in the month where there, are, there is snow, and in winter where the uh, weather is beautiful but in between you have uh, nearly nobody in this uh, village uh-huh. so concerts but uh, at present in uh, January or February there are a lot of people there in Alpedrez and uh, a lot of come to the uh, concert which is on Thursday and we invite uh, uh, a very famous organist from the whole world mm-hmm. not from Vilnius no, nobody claims from Vilnius at present but uh, uh, <laughs> come from uh, Russia from America from uh, everywhere I see and Jean-Paul uh, how many people live in uh, Alpe d'Huez uh, um, is it a small village or a larger town no, no, in, uh, it's what I said, between the ski times, mm-hmm. you have maybe uh, 1,000 people or 2,000, but in in February, you have 20,000, mm-hmm. which is different because all people coming to make ski. Right. Uh, and uh, do do the people who, the ski tourists, right, do they come to your organ concerts as well? Not all, but a, a lot of them. Yes, we have a good, uh, cr- uh, not a crowd, but a good audience for mm-hmm. our concerts. Yes. And uh, the, the concert were created uh, as, as soon when the organ was finished, that's in uh, 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. So every every Thursday during this period, and it's still going. Uh-huh. And, uh, uh, so as we are speaking, probably it's it's uh, it's a skiing uh, season right now, right? Yes. Winter. So yes. the cultural life and and the ski life in 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 this little village is very very active, right? Very active, and so we started. The first concert was just. Uh, uh, after Christmas, and we, there was one afterwards, and tomorrow is the fourth concert already of the year as a young French organist. And uh, uh, before we have an English choir, and uh, it's very different from one week to another one. We make a lot of organ plus that's organ with flute, organ with trumpet, organ with choir, organ with piano, and with uh, a lot of things like this. Is that because? Uh, <laughs> 
uh, people who are not organists, right, who who listen to to the concerts, who generally come to to this resort uh, to ski, and in the in the evenings they come to to the concerts just in case, right, to 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 have fun. Uh, do you find that this variety of uh, repertoire and organ plus other instruments is more uh, ap- appeals more to the general public? And there is also, I don't know if you have seen uh, photographies of the church and organ of Alpha West, but the organ is like an, in a concert hall. Mm-hmm. So uh, the public, the audience sees mm-hmm. the organ is playing. So that's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the most uh, difficult things in a cathedral or a church where the organ is located in, up in the balcony yes, is that yeah. it's not visible, right? Well, what's in Alpedwez, in Notre Dame de Neige, everybody can see the organist. And, uh, and after, generally after the concert, people come to the organ and speak and ask, what are you doing with your feet? <laughs> That's very strange what people ask. Mm-hmm. And do you explain to them also uh, yes, what you're doing and what what is challenging to you oh. and what is fun to you? No, of course, it's, uh-huh. it's always a very good moment after the concert when mm-hmm. all people ask the question and sometimes we have to do to play another piece and uh, so just be examples. Mm-hmm. Very pleasant moment. As you organize those uh, organ festivals and concert series, uh, what is the most um, um, challenging thing for you, Jean-Paul, um, in terms of, I don't know, getting public to the church or m- doing some uh, publicity and marketing work or organization work? What is the most challenging for you? Well, I think it's uh, f- 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 I think a, a little bit of everything, but uh, mm-hmm. uh, f- first of all, the the main problem, uh, everything in Alpedrez has been created was a general uh, priest, we was from Holland, and he made this church. He built the church in eighteen uh, in nineteen sixty eight. After that, he said we need an organ, so he asked to have an organ. And after that, he said if we have an organ, we have to receive organists because there were no organists there. And uh, if we want to have organists for the church service on Sunday, maybe we could put the uh, recital in the middle of the week, so organists would arrive on Sunday, stay the week, and uh, make a ski in between. So it it started like this, and it's still going on. So as uh, as a titular, I just come three times in the year. Yeah, but every week we have an, a different organist playing for church service on Sunday, who last who stays in a flat till the, uh, Thursday for the concert and goes back on the, on a Friday, and then comes the following one. That's, uh, it's, it's it's a dream come true when you say this this uh, uh, priest from uh, from Holland, right? First he builds the church, right? Then he needs an organ, right? Then he needs an organist, and then concerts, right? Right? And uh, it's a really a, a fairy tale when you think about it. In many many cases, it's the opposite: uh, no organist, no organ, and no concerts. Right? Just church. Mm. Oh, yes, yes. As, uh, in many village in uh, Alps, because Alps is very high, and it's eighteen hundred meters high, you know, and and the mountain just uh, above is. Uh, 3,600 meters high, so all this in the fresh air, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and in such villages, they are not always organs, I mean in France, in Switzerland, yes, there are organs, and in Germany also, but in France, in little villages, you have no organs, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it was really a, a wonder to have this beautiful instrument in Alpedrez. Mm-hmm. And um, um, how many manuals does it have? This small instrument, it was designed by Jean Guillou, mm-hmm. and Jean Guillou has always uh, very uh, inventive ideas for building organ. It was one of the first instrument he built, and so he made a small instrument with the 24 stops, two manuals, and uh, the uh, organ has a f- shape of a hand, maybe you have seen. Uh, I've seen, yes, yeah, the very famous one. Mm-hmm. So with a small instrument, but he decided that that would not be uh, uh, like a choir organ with just foundation stops and maybe a uh, whole But No, he said is every stop should be like a solist instrument in an orchestra. So in this organ, which is very small, we have uh, many reeds. For instance, in the swell, we have uh, obo or shaman, horizontal mm-hmm. obo. We have a trumpet eight and a bombard sixteen. Uh-huh. In, 
in the great. We have a uh, great cornet, for instance. We have a uh, ronquette, 16 foot, a comorn, 8 foot, and a trumpet, en chamade. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, in the pedal, we have a bombard, 16 foot, and a clairon, 4 foot. So many reeds on these instruments. So, Fantastic. And, uh, of course, they are beautiful foundation stuff. But for instance, people are uh, surprised there is no Bordeaux, no Bourdon or Gedak in, in, in German. Mm-hmm. No, the, the foundation stop are flutes, bit beautiful flute harmonic in the swell and flute in the uh, great. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but that happens because the organ is not that big and uh, the church is probably not uh, like a cathedral, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, the medium sized instrument fits mm-hmm. the room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the, the sound is wonderful and the acoustic in the, in the church is also very good because it's a combination of wood and uh, stone or beton. I don't know what the word for beton. And uh, it makes a very good uh, acoustic, not too much reverberation just a little one and it's very precise and always very easy to accompany a singer or a violin or a cello or everything do, do you like uh, uh, Jean-Paul do you like uh, to ski yourself I did no not so much but I was very fond of ski a few uh-huh. years ago <laughs> a few years ago, great. Uh, yes. It's it's a great sport, but sometimes dangerous, right? Hey, Bobby, uh, I have some uh, organism coming to give a reshuttle. We had uh, problems on the day of the concert, uh-huh. and I know one we had to play just with uh, a few, uh, not all the fingers, and it was a bit problematic, yes, uh, because he, he had fallen. Uh, yes, yes, and you can f- hurt your back if you fall in the wrong yes, way, right? It mm-hmm. could be dangerous. So dangerous. So, uh, amazing, uh, amazing concert life uh, in this little village, right uh, around the ski uh, ski tourists, right uh, in the in the winter. Uh, but uh, how do you find your uh, listeners in the summer? Uh, of course, not too many come, right? Um, in the summer, people come because in the mountains, when you have no snow, you can make beautiful walks. And uh, ah. people come to walk in the mountain, and uh, we have also possibility of playing golf or tennis or, or just uh, breathe the fresh air. So in the in the summer, we have also uh, quite uh, a lot of people. And every summer also, I make a seminary. Uh, which is lasting three weeks, and where I receive uh, about 25 organists from everywhere, and it makes for so, uh, uh, some public for, for the concerts, and they will play for concerts, of course. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, in the winter, the people can ski, and in the in the summer, they can walk in the in the in the mountains, which is very refreshing, of course. And still come back to the church for the organ concert. Of course, exactly. And you have also skating and a swimming pool and a lot of things because in Alpedres it's a, a place for sport much more than for <laughs> music and but sport is very important uh-huh. because you know, if you have heard of this uh, cycling uh, uh, which is the Tour de France yes of that where people on bicycles and to go to Alpedres you have a, a road with uh, 27 curves so we go from 1000 meters to 1700 meters uh-huh. just in, uh, in tw- 20 curves oh. so it's a big uh, it's very impressive to see all the people on their bicycles to make this and every year we have the Tour de France and it brings a crowd a fantastic crowd to Alcatraz yeah of course it's very challenging to ride a bicycle up in the mountains right yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't I don't do, no. No. <laughs> it's not my my favorite no it's great not. so um uh, so, Jean-Paul, um, you made uh, uh, interesting uh, organ transcriptions of uh, symphonic works, right? Can yes. you tell us a little bit about the Preludes of Liszt or uh, Prokofiev or uh, Tristan and Isolde and others? Uh, yeah. what, what fascinates you about organ transcriptions? I think uh, that is the instrument we bring that day for when you have a big instrument is an orchestra and you are the alone the only uh, performer so you can play what you like so it's interesting and I remember when I was a child I saw this movie uh, telling the life of Roberto Benzi he was conducting the prelude list and the 
the name of this movie was Prelude à la Gloire. And, uh, and I remember at that time, I had already the, um, uh, I wanted to play that on the organ. So it lasted many, many years. And suddenly, maybe uh, 40 years afterwards, I decided to make this transcription, which uh, I now play. But of course, it's, it's sounding very well on uh, Alpe d'Huez with uh, only 24 registers. But, uh, it's very um, interesting to play on a very beautiful organ, like in Notre Dame de Paris or in Saint Eustache, which I did uh, already. Yes. Uh -huh. Also made the transcription of Prokofiev. I remember it was um, um, the father of a young um, a young guy who had committed suicide, and uh, the father was very sad. And he came to me and he said, "My son was always listening to to this music. I would be very." Uh, happy if, uh, if you could uh, make a transcription and play that at a mass for him in the organ. So that's why I made this Prokofiev transcription. But I, won, I am glad to have made it because it's sounding quite, uh, I like the sound of this on the organ. Mm -hmm. Also make, uh, of course, uh, Wagner, yes, Tristan uh, is old and uh, uh, Haydn, Mozart. I just make transcription of works I do like very much, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the listeners do they react to to well-known symphonic works differently than to to classical organ repertoire mm -hmm. yes um, because they know they know those symphonic works right and recognize them right away right mm -hmm. so they probably love your transcriptions to hear yes generally yes i, I never had a negative um, opinions about that and all, all these who come to concert are very happy to hear them in, uh, different version uh, with, uh, of course when I'm playing at the organ I try to to be the nearest possible from the orchestral version but uh, but uh, for instance uh, Isolde and Wagner I made a recording in Cannes in Cannes Notre Dame de Montréal that's a wonderful organ wonderful instrument and you can have a lot of wonderful sonorities with oboes with uh, flutes and uh, so you can nearly be an orchestra yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how do you start uh, the process of transcribing uh, such a work? Uh, what's the first step for you? Well, sir, uh, it was to be to have the, the work in my in my mind and to, mm -hmm. to, to know everything, uh, uh, to know, of course, the structure and uh, see what what is possible also technically because sometimes it's so difficult. To, you have to uh, uh, when you see, for instance, Glenn Gould, how he made a transcription of. Uh, uh, Wagner, I don't know what it is, uh, and he said he had to take completely one uh, voice apart and make to, uh, make a real recording because in uh, in the organ transcription you have more possibility, of course, with the foot and uh, and uh, so that's we have to decide technically what is possible, what is not, and mm -hmm. uh, and then when you have the piece in your head, it comes. Uh, it comes not, uh, very easily. Uh, very easily. So first, yeah. first thing you have to know the piece inside out yes. very well, yes. right? Yes. And then, yes. and then, you have to know what can you really play technically, right? What kind of passages on the organ, right? Yes. How many voices can be heard together, and uh, how how would it be possible to make uh, this sound on an organ? And, uh, so uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, pieces I would never transcribe. And uh, when you need so particular, for instance, percussions, uh, the organ will have no percussions, and so some works of orchestra we need too much percussion uh, could not be adapted to the organ, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or you made an adaptation for organ and percussion, so. so. But uh, what I made till now is uh, uh, never asks more than what is in uh, mm -hmm, all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh, but sometimes, uh, let's say, imaginary situation when you have to have a per percussion, right? And you can't really adapt percussion to the organ, mm, um, but you can invite percussionists to, to play together with you, right? Like this piece, uh, Bolero con de Concert, um, by by one of the French uh, masters. Uh, I've heard this uh, last year, uh, n not solo work for the organ, but together with the tambourine, right? And it uh, works beautifully. Ah, yes, of course, Pepe mm -hmm. and organ, yes. Yeah. Oh, of course, uh, I played also with uh, also with um, brass 
Kirk has sent an organ, there's also a rich sounds, a good mixture of sounds, yes. I like that, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, uh, Jean Paul, do you think that uh, transcri transcriptions uh, f of symphonic uh, works are getting more popular today than before? I, I don't know what you call before, because one of the master of the transcription was uh, Edwin Lemaire. Yes, but but was yeah. that was in the past, and then uh, it was a period when, uh, let's mm. say, neo baroque uh, repertoire uh, and sounds and organs became a fashion. And but mm. I feel now that it's it's a revival of organ transcriptions today. It, it needs uh, you have an organ to play that transcription. Mm -hmm. Lemay had this big American organ, so he, can, he could play uh, Brahms, he could play uh, Emperdink, he could play uh, Dvorak, he could play anything on these organs. If you have uh, just a baroque organ with two manuals and mixture and orids, you can you cannot play all this music. And uh, but uh, if you are in France, we have uh, already some very nice instruments, of course, uh, and you need also a modern instrument to, where you can change uh, the sounds with pistons, because if, if you need uh, two people all the time to manage the wrestlers, it's not possible. But we have a modern instrument with a rich palette of sounds. You can play uh, symphonic pieces, of course, yes. Exactly, uh, the right kind of instrument will do the work if it's if it's it has a nice combination action, right? Because if you do everything by hand uh, mechanically, it, you need at least two assistants, right? Yes, it's uh, not not possible. Mm. Uh, uh, yes, uh, no, no. When you have a modern instrument, you can. Uh, can do everything yourself and uh, so you can make music because if you are always to think and say oh you have to pull the trumpet if you your mind is always uh, f full of these ideas as you cannot make music and, uh, so Jean Paul uh, what's next for you uh, what are you working na right now on the organ and what are your plans for this year and the next what's the most important for you mm. Or I all, I'm always trying to study new pieces. Uh, I uh, uh, I would like to study pieces of contemporary music, which I never studied till now from uh, some of my friends, organists, like uh, Jean-Baptiste Robin, who is a good composer. And, uh, I've never studied music from him. I think I will do it now. And uh, um, But I have also to maintain the repertoire I uh, play, and which is quite a lot, because uh, I can play a lot of pieces, and uh, I must not uh, forget and, uh, them. And, uh, I study every day for this. And, uh, so, Jean-Paul, do you think that um, um, composing for the organ uh, in France, for example, today, is, is, uh, is the same, has the same um, importance as in the past, uh, let's say, middle of the 20th century, when the great masters uh, Dupré, Langlais, Messiaen, and Tournemire and um, uh, others were alive, right? And they were constantly creating new music, not only improvising, but creating and writing Make it down. It, yes. Is when it you still see, the. For instance, Marcel Dupré had made a fantastic work, and uh, mm -hmm. so many pieces, Olivier Messiaen, of course. Uh, you have uh, Gaston Littes, who has written a lot of pieces, and uh, after that, you now you have uh, many young composers, uh, like uh, Jean-Louis Florence, like Jean-Baptiste Robin, like uh, Valérie Aubertin, mm -hmm. but they are not yet very well known from the public, but I hope uh, for them that their music will be played and uh, renewed. Yes. So composing for the organ in France is still a living tradition, right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. We have many people uh, writing, yes. I don't know if they are much played, but uh, yes, uh, many composers are writing for the instrument. Because sometimes I get the impression that improvisation is... Uh is a living tradition more than than writing it down as a piece uh, create uh, composition but you live there you probably feel the the cultural uh, uh, pulse of the, of this country right so you see, you're saying that 
composing for the organ will survive in the in France. Ah, yes, of course. I know uh, many, uh, not many, but uh, some composers uh, around me, and uh, you write uh, regularly uh, works for your instrument. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and the problem is that uh, sometimes the works are very difficult to play technically. So, of course, for the beginners, it's a problem, but uh, uh, there is, and there is. Uh, personal language so you cannot uh, uh, immediately it's not if you uh, hear to uh, a new work of Gabriel Fauré or <laughs> Scammy Saint-Saëns immediately you feel attracted with modern contemporary music sometimes uh, it's uh, more difficult to get uh, uh, fascinated with yeah. the, uh, the best thing you hope with uh, Gabriel Fauré and other masters of the past is to transcribe their own music from uh, from symphonic works, right, to, to to organ. But now, when when you have those living composers, they can constantly create something new, right? Something mm, of living. Course, uh -huh. mm -hmm. Of course, and they do, and there are uh, there are a lot of in uh, in competitions, for instance, organ competition. You have always uh, modern pieces which are given for students, and uh, some are quite interesting and difficult to play. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Jean Louis Florence. I said him. Uh, his name a few moments ago is very very often played yes and uh, he died not so long ago mm -hmm. so it's one of the most important modern composers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, so yes do you like composing for the organ yourself Jean-Paul? No no I think I'm not enough yeah, and, and personal ideas so I think I, r I wrote two pieces in my life and I am no no not very interested to to go but I think others do that much better than I do Mm. I see, and of course, uh, uh, the composers needs organists like yourself to to play those music, right? In in different countries to make it known to other uh, continents, so that mm. other organists could also expand mm. and play this repertoire. So thank you so much for your generosity and time, uh, Jean Paul, today, and I wish you all the success and creativity in playing those modern pieces of your organist friends, right? Uh, that you know and and you like uh, so that uh, different kinds of organists and uh, audiences around the world will mm -hmm. get the chance to hear them well, thank you so much for, for this conversation I was very pleased to know you and to talk with you excellent you. excellent Jean Paul of course our listeners are eager to know uh, better uh, you and your work can you give our listeners a link to your website or some some, uh, some other place online where get, they could get a chance to know your work better. Oh, I think I have a website. Uh, the address, I think it's very easy to just write my name on uh, Google and uh, you go to my website and then you are di redirected to uh, all the um, aspect of my musical life. And so, uh, uh, I'm looking at your website. It's ambertjampol.fr, which is spelled I M B E R T J E A N P A U L dot F R. Correct? Uh, correct, exactly. Great. So I'll make sure I'll put this link into the description of this podcast so that people could literally click on the link and visit your uh, your uh, online website and uh, get to know more about you and your work, your videos, recordings and other things that you have there for, yes, for them. You, right? yeah, there are also a few pieces of, uh, which I played and uh, on different organs. So yes. Yes. So that was fun. Thank you so much, Jean-Paul. Jean uh, our conversation went very quickly, like a good recital. Thank you very much. And goodbye. And I hope we speak again in a few times. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog, Secrets of Organ Playing, at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus. Thanks for listening. And I'll catch you.
you online really soon.